Hello, people. Uh, welcome to tonight's Zoom session. Um, so uh, many of you, I'm sure, will already know Ian uh, Binney of the Gallipoli Association, the Education Officer. Um, I'm involved here because I'm a Manchester resident. I live about a mile from Southern Cemetery. Uh, I'm chair of the Manchester Military History Society. And um, Ian contacted me some time ago and said we we're interested in looking into Southern Cemetery um, and we're, we're interested in finding the graves and memorials to soldiers that served in Gallipoli. So I, th I think we would only do this for no more than, than three months or so. And we're, we're quite surprised as to how much progress we've made. Um, and we found about 20 graves. You're going to, hopefully you'll see all of them. No, no, there's, there's, <laughs> there's one we found today, so you won't see that one. Um, so we'll begin with, with Ian giving you uh, an overview of Gallipoli, just in case uh, you're not uh, very familiar with it. Uh, then I will talk about the Australians and Ian will talk about the, uh, the British soldiers. Um, so there we go. Uh, over to you, Ian. Okay, right. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so um, I'm going to quickly go through um, the uh, a summary of the Gallipoli campaign. Some of you are very familiar and perhaps even know more than I do about the Gallipoli campaign, uh, but some of you are relatively uh, relative newcomers. Um, so the first thing, where is Gallipoli? Um, if you can see my cursor, uh, there it is. There's also Gallipoli in Italy over here, which has nothing to do with our story. Um, but you've got Gallipoli, uh, the Gallipoli Peninsula there. And, oh, my slides aren't moving. Why are my slides not moving? Sorry, I'm going to have to stop share. Uh, no, 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 Ian, just click mm. on the picture and then try right mouse button. That often fixes it. Uh, next, yeah, hang on. Where's my cursor gone? So I've lost my cursor now. We'll try hitting N. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, got it. Okay, there we go. Do it that way, right? Okay, um, sorry about that. Uh, so there is, uh, there are the Dardanelles, rather, um, which are uh, always have been a very crucial. Uh, seaway connecting uh, the Mediterranean down here with the Black Sea. Um, part then, 1914, was not Turkey, although Turkey was part of it, uh, the Ottoman Empire. And the capital was Constantinople. And the Gallipoli Peninsula, um, about a fortieth of the size of Wales, runs along there. And these Dardanelles Straits, very, very important. But most of the fighting took place um, over that uh, uh, red spot uh, there. OK, so. so um, OK, so the main events that we're going to look at, uh, the naval attacks, uh, the landings at Hellas and Anzac, attempted breakouts, Gully Ravine and Krithia, which is very, very important to our story. I'll talk about that in detail later on. The Suva landings, diversionary attacks, the August offensive, um, particularly August the 21st. Peter Hart, the historian, said it's one of the um, most badly organised offensives in, in the First World War. Trench deadlock and this horrible thing, wastage, continual casualties um, through... Um, through um, Excuse me, just shut the door. Casualties from snipers, from artillery fire, and so on. And then a bit of a, a plot spoiler, um, you have uh, the evacuation, because uh, the Allies lost. The Allies, the Anzacs, the British, um, the French uh, landed and uh, failed to achieve their objectives and had to evacuate. Um, so the strategy, um, initially it was only going to be a naval attack. There was not gonna be a land campaign at all. 
and that was it was a victory for the Easterners, um, one of whom was um, uh, Winston Churchill, of course, and, and they believed that the war could uh, be won in the East. It wasn't going so well even by early 1915. They'd realised it wasn't going so well in the West, um, but it could be won in the East. And the idea was to knock Turkey quickly out of the war. And the Allies continually underestimated the Turks. Uh, there's this phrase you may have heard of, the sick man of Europe. And um, the Turkish army had done very badly in the Balkan Wars and wars with Russia, for example. And the, uh, the Allies, certainly the British, thought it would be a very good, uh, a very um, easy victory and knocking the Turkish prop out of the, uh, from under Germany. Um, they could then go on and knock out Bulgaria, for example, and, uh, and eventually Austria-Hungary, leaving Germany isolated. They also wanted to uh, open an easier supply route to Russia, and uh, the Russians were pressing for that, and uh, particularly as two Turkish warships um, bombarded, um, bombarded Odessa. Um, um, in late 1914, just to show uh, the dangers of this two-front war that Russia was involved in. Could it ever have been succeeded? Could it ever have succeeded, rather? Probably not, not with the resources that were allocated to it. Um, but uh, we can discuss that very briefly at the end. So, the first Turkish victory, because I've already spoiled the plot and said the Turks won, um, and the first Turkish victory, the 18th of March. And um, we um, commemorate in many, many aspects of the uh, Gallipoli campaign on the 25th of April each year. The Turks um, commemorate it on the 18th of March uh, because that's the uh, when they defeated the second attack. There were two large naval attacks, 19th of February and 18th of March, 1915. Uh, the uh, idea was that minesweepers went in and uh, took out the mines. The Allied ships then sailed through, um, um, contested with the Turkish shore guns, uh, suppressed the fire of the Turkish shore guns, and then sailed to Constantinople, bombarded the capital, and the Turks would uh, surrender. But it didn't happen that way. The minesweepers couldn't get there because of the power of the shore guns. There were masses of them. Uh, the Allies have continually uh, underestimated the Turks and they certainly underestimated the defences, which of the Dardanelles were phenomenal and had also had German help. Very, uh, you shouldn't really credit the Germans with uh, every Turkish success. The Turks were very good at warfare at that point, um, but um, the Germans were involved there. Uh, so a number of French and British sh ships were sunk. So the idea. Uh, was to land the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force to nullify the guns. Nullify the guns, the minesweepers could go in, and the original plan could go on. Um, and Sir Ian Hamilton, a controversial choice, he was a very capable, not controversial choice at the time, he was a very capable general, a very learned general, had a very good career up to then, was known as a very knowledgeable um, commander. He was put in charge. The Turks had a long time to prepare. The Allies didn't. They only had a matter of weeks to get ready. Uh, the Turks had plenty of time to prepare because they thought a land, uh, a land campaign uh, was going to come. And as I've said many times, the Allies consistently underestimated the Turks because uh, they'd forgotten about certain victories, uh, certain victories that they'd had. Um, for example. Uh, against Italy, the Second Balkan War, and against Italy in Libya. Um, so, and organised again by the Germans, the Turkish army was really shaping up. So, uh, there's a picture, a painting of uh, uh, the um, attempt to get through the Dardanelles, but was unsuccessful, of course, as we've seen. And uh, a bit of fake news, this man was supposed to have carried the shell which sunk uh, on its own a British ship. 
and he's part of the there's a big celebration every time on the 18th of march uh, with this around the statue of this gentleman but the shipping concerned and the ship concerned actually probably hit a mine but it's a great story it carried this huge weight of shell and uh, it sunk a british battleship there's sir ian hamilton with a couple of the uh, naval commanders he's uh, the second from the right there i'm not sure he ever landed on the dardanelles um, on the gallipoli peninsula rather he stayed on his boat uh, anchored off shore um, no we're not oh, there we are okay so not just the australians can it be often associated with the anzacs when i mention that i um uh, i do work for the Gallipoli association they say oh well, that's the that's the australians isn't it and we'll refer to the australians later on uh but there are fifty thousand australians thirteen thousand new zealand it's very very important for both countries and we'll come back to that later on and we mustn't ever uh, neglect their contribution but the majority of allied troops are british irish strong contingent from the empire including india and newfoundland not canada newfoundland was a separate colony at the time a separate dominion at the time 420,000 allied troops were put in there and you might think hang on that's an awful lot of troops um given that it was supposed to be a naval attack and it's a classic example as i've said later on in the slide of mission creep classic example mission creep there's a large french contingent 80,000 who performed pretty well actually um Britain initially sent only one regular division, the 29th Division, the in, don, incomparable 29th, and um, just compared with the uh, Napoleon's old guard, um, whether that's right or not, is another matter. The 29th Division, regular division, and also the Royal Naval Division, which had been formed uh, by Churchill from uh, naval reservists, not expecting to fight on the land, uh, but they did. Um, but those two divisions were not nearly enough so you have this mission creep and territorial divisions we'll spend some time talking about the territorials later on uh, they followed and then newly formed kitchener division sent in august and half a million troops allied troops actually served there and if that isn't an example of mission creep i don't know what is just a naval attack with two divisions and then eventually half a million allied troops and given the fact as we know they were unsuccessful um, so um, there we go so there's the Gallipoli Peninsula and uh, there were landings in uh, on April the 25th these beaches around here at Hellas Krithia was supposed to be captured on the first day uh, Achibaba was a objective on the first day uh, this is Anzac Cove ignore Suva Bay for the moment this is Anzac Cove where the Australians landed also on the 25th of April uh, 1915 uh, which is why it is uh, celebrated commemorated Anzac Day on that day 25th of April by Australians all over the world Um, so the Hellis landings, 29th Division, I mentioned the Royal Naval Division provided the infantry, light resistance, three of the beaches, opportunities lost. Um, three of the beaches, no real, um, no real um, resistance, um, uh, but the troops there didn't go in to, uh, to help the other two beaches, V Beach and W Beach, very, very heavy casualties. Uh, troops landed at the River Clyde and likewise at W Beach very heavy casualties and uh, we're obviously interested in things northwest in this talk um, but the Lancashire Fusiliers were awarded six VCs uh, before breakfast for their part in the um, in the uh, landings on W Beach and there's the River Clyde, troops pouring off it. That was, it was quite a good idea, almost a Trojan horse type thing. Um, but that was the result, very, very heavy casualties. And as happens in war, the Turkish resistance was exaggerated. There was only one battalion of Turks there. They didn't have any machine guns. The stories they had machine guns and all sorts of things. Um, but you see there, 
um, a scene reminiscent of the uh, the first part of Saving Private Ryan. Troops desperately seeking shelter there, and uh, casualties, very severe casualties. So troops here um, uh, seeking shelter, wounded and dying over here. And one of the Mancunians was actually, we think, involved in that uh, in that landing, or rather the next landing, rather uh, the six VCs before breakfast at um, at uh, uh, W Beach. Um, so, as often happened, uh, well, we'll talk about the Anzac landings. Many of the troops landed far too far north in difficult terrain, became very entangled. Um, the troops mixed up, took many hours before moving towards their objectives. A number of the Australians, uh, Tim is going to talk about, were involved in those landings, either the very first landings or the landings a couple of hours after. Um, and um, uh, uh, even moving towards their objectives was difficult. They became under very heavy fire um, from the 5th Division, 5th Turkish Division, 5th uh, Yes, I think it was the 5th Turkish Division, organised by uh, a General Mustafa Kemal, had big, considerable experience fighting the Italians, fighting the Balkan states, and he, of course, became uh, Kemal Ataturk, the leader of modern Turkey. At one point, the Allied leaders considered moving, uh, evacuating Birdwood, the Australian uh, general, um, considered evacuating, but the Anzacs managed to hang on. And apparently that's where um, the, the nickname Diggers come from, um, because Ian Hamilton heard they were considering eva evacuating and they were told um, to dig in, to dig in. And that's where apparently the Diggers came from, I was told today. So it all resulted in stalemate. Um, and because of these lost opportunities, the Turks quickly reinforced Hellas, stalemate across the southern peninsula, Costly battles at Krithia, we'll be talking about Third Krithia, crucial battle, 4th of June, 1915. Gully Ravine, uh, one of the uh, Gallipolians in the cemetery, was involved in that with the 4th Royal Scots. Often um, allied attacks, inadequate artillery preparation, achieve very little. Poor quality generalship, who their answer was just a bayonet charge, a bayonet charge um, to drive the Turks away. Anzacs were hemmed in, one and a half mile beachhead, dominated very, very high ground, very high ground, very, very difficult. But the Turks did also launch major offensives and uh, they, um, they uh, suffered very heavy casualties. And a familiar picture, that's in front of Krithia. You can see Krithia in the distance. That's a real picture of troops dying in no man's land. In there were five attacks on that village. Remember, it was one of the objectives in the first day. And uh, you had that trench, uh, that um, uh, the trench systems on both sides, similar to the Western Front and um, a stalemate. That's a picture actually of um, of myself and Tim, really. I'm there with the, uh, my hat on the, sh uh, Tim said, put your hat on the rifle there and see what happens. There's a young looking Tim down in the corner, just dozing off as I'm doing it. So, um, so Hamilton was no fool. He wasn't a great general. There's a lot of controversy about him, but with the new division, some of the new divisions he'd been allocated, uh, he tried a new landing further north in the rear of the Turks at Suvla, caught the Turks completely by surprise and uh, the landing on 6th of August, virtually unopposed. Very poor leadership by Stockford, um, Brigadier G um, yes, General Stockford, uh, meant opportunities were lost. And we heard on the Tuesday talk that there were 15,000 Allied soldiers landed at one time opposing only 700 Turks, but they just didn't press in land. And the Turks reinforced the area and um, uh, took the high ground and the Allies once again forced to actually attack uphill. Um, and there's a picture of the landings at Suvla. Sorry, just I won't go back. There's a picture of the landings at Suvla, but there's Suvla Bay there and there's Anzac Cove and there's Helles, which we've talked about uh, before. And there's an lost opportunity. That doesn't look like an army pressing 
on, does it? It looks like an army who haven't been ordered to seize the initiative. Uh, that's the British Army soon after landing at Suvla Bay. And the problem was not the troops. The troops, the generals like to blame the troops, the territorials and the uh, Kitchener volunteers particularly, uh, but they were not ordered to press on. Stopford wanted to consolidate the beachhead first. Um, lots of supporting attacks, um, very heavy casualties um, in attacks that occurred at the same time. Um, there was some success at Gully Ravine. British troops suffered very heavy casualties at Krithia Vineyard. That's the, the battle in August after Third Krithia, which we're going to look at. Our Anzac troops, Anzac and Allied troops, briefly seized the highest point, Shannon Bay, and looked down on the other side. And uh, uh, that was a brief moment of success. They eventually driven off. The attack at the neck um, on August the 6th featured in the film Gallipoli, rather anti-English film, uh, but uh, the attack is actually uh, very movingly portrayed. Uh, but despite the limited successes, casualties were very high. And there's a scene, of course, from uh, the film Gallipoli, but they were scenes repeated all across the peninsula in these attacks to support the Suva landings. And the final offensive, um, uh, Hamilton uh, got rid, probably thinking he was his head was on the block as it was. A senior, a cull of senior officers, Stopford went. Last major offensive in the Suva front, 21st of August, futile, badly coordinated attack. Hamilton was replaced soon after. Military career ended. He spent most of the time trying to justify uh, what he had done and swing the uh, the uh, the conclusions of the uh, military of uh, the Royal Commission. Uh, campaign settled down to a very unpleasant deadlock, limited Allied offensives, re resulting in heavy casualties and things like line straightening, straightening the trench lines, and so on. Uh, the key thing: the Allies didn't have enough of this. Many of the divisions, and we'll talk about the 42nd Division, the East Lancashire Division, didn't take artillery with them. Um, did they think it was going to, they didn't need the artillery, it was too easy. Um, there wasn't room when they got there. There wasn't enough. There was a big shortage, of course, of artillery on the Western Front and shells, particularly on the Western Front. So perhaps not surprising they didn't have enough there. Uh, so the beginning of the end, politicians, allied politicians, tired of the campaign, even Churchill was tired of it. Some divisions sent to Salonika. Casualties continue to mount from sniping, trench raids, limited offensives, this terrible term, wastage. Disease was rife, dysentery swept through both armies. And then just to cap it all, the weather in November, particularly bad. Over 500 allied troops died in uh, November from uh, exposure or being drowned in um, uh, floods, flash floods in from torrential downpours. So the evacuation of it, ironically, the best managed aspect of the campaign, although you know, Churchill said of Dunkirk that evacuations don't win wars, and this one didn't. Suvlanzak evacuated in December, Hellas in January. No Allied casualties. I think there was one, one, one soldier and his arm broken by a bit of flying a kit that was when it was blown up. Masses of equipment left behind, much of it made, and so hundreds and hundreds of horses and mules uh, were slaughtered. Um, casualties, Allied casualties, approximately 302,000, 557,000 being French. The French don't remember, don't remember uh, Gallipoli at all. Of those casualties, well over a third were due to sickness, and the Turks lost approximately. 250,000. So pretty good, uh, pretty high butcher's bill for what was started as a naval campaign. And there's the evacuation, very famous picture of troops being towed out. And the debate, historians, particularly within the Guilty Association, uh, whether it should ever have been undertaken. Um, Germany, they think Germany Historians have said Germany would have carried on. Turkey wasn't a prop to Germany. It was the other way around. 
Uh, and some historians have said opening the supply route to Russia would just wasted even more scarce resources, scarce resources on the Russians. Uh, some say that Turkey, if not having to defend the peninsula, and remember the peninsula was its own territory, the Turks' own territory. They weren't fighting to defend uh, Palestine, defend um, uh, um, parts of the Arab world, which they conquered centuries before. They were actually defending their own uh, own homeland. Um, but so perhaps they could have put more of a threat to Egypt. Um, I think that's conjecture. And some lessons were learned that were used in World War II, apparently the evacuation of the Paris at Arnhem. Um, they used the lessons they'd learned in the, um, in the evacuation at Gallipoli. But I think most people agree that it achieved very little. And that's not to take away from the great bravery of those young men uh, that went there. And uh, I heard a great phrase from Stephen Chambers uh, that you shouldn't, uh, similar to you shouldn't put new wine in old bottles, um, you shouldn't put um, uh, inexperienced, enthusiastic troops under command of very old, uh, incapable generals. And that really was uh, the feature of the Gallipoli campaign. And so that's my bit um, for the moment. I'll stop sharing and hand over to you, Tim. Totally good. Right. OK, so I will share my screen and that one there and that one there. So Ian, just reassure me what you see there. Yes. Yes. Can see it. Big white screen. Lovely. OK, yeah. so first thing to do is to give you a, a very brief introduction to Southern Cemetery itself. Um, so it is uh, um, so opened in 1879. Um, it's the largest municipal cemetery in the UK, the second largest in Europe. Uh, so, so it's quite big and there's a number of interesting people in there as well as our Gallipoli people um here we have a the, the full size of the um of the cemetery uh so really it's in two parts with uh there's nell lane going through the middle and there's a big hospital over to the right over here which is off the screen which is known as withington hospital um the bit in the north is the new section uh but uh, for today we're we're not concerned about that we're only interested in the old section which is the south bit and uh, there we see just the south section there uh, now to find your way around i do encourage people to visit the southern cemetery to find your way around each block as it were has a letter but you have to know which denomination you're looking for so um Roman Catholics are over here in the east side. Church of England, the majority are kind of mostly around here. Nonconformists over here. We have a Jewish section here and a few, uh, and the, there's Muslims tend to be up here in the northwest section. Uh, for World War I, we have a cross of remembrance here where my red dot is, just to the left of that M. Um, and that's where our tour will, will was this afternoon and uh, this morning this afternoon. Uh, World War Two is kind of commemorated over here. That's that, that's a little World War Two block there. So we'll just go to the next slide, which is kind of the same thing, but but it's done differently with uh, different colours uh, to show things. So um, should you be trying to follow the route um, of this, uh, I'll see how well this works so the cross of sacrifice is there the australians that uh, we, we will talk about in a moment are in the q section here with some uh, kiwis over here um most of the the graves that we found are in this block here the s block as it were and then um the route that we took Today, we're going round here. There's one gentleman here. Um, there's another gentleman just here. This is the, the fellow with the death penny. 
Over here we have a fellow called Jackson who actually died in Colwyn Bay. Uh, we the the new grave that was found uh, is just here. Um, I've actually Ian, I've I've got a photograph of that on Facebook, so I can share that in a moment. And then finally, we were looking at uh, a medical gentleman there, and then a family grave there, a family where th they lost three soldiers during the war. So that clears that, and uh, I need to move that away. And then um, I've been visiting the, the cemetery for kind of 20 odd years and so on. Um, the gentleman on the right in this photograph is Dr. P Paddy Griffith, who's a very dear friend of mine. And uh, we did a tour way back in, uh, let's say, sorry, 2005, 2006, something like that. Uh, if you go to the cemetery office uh, and ask for the sheet of notable graves, they will very happily give you this sheet here, which includes a whole range of people. Uh, there's two Victoria Cross winners, uh, various other people in the in the cemetery. Um, but today we're just we're just looking at our Gallipoli people. So we'll start with the Australians. A very good place to start the letter a um so when the war kicks off in august 1914 uh australia already has uh a small volunteer army various battalions uh and from memory i think it's the 11th the 15th and the 16th but uh, we will see on the gra the gravestones um and so what happens is word gets through to Australia. So they put their, their soldiers on troop ships, send them through the Indian Ocean, through the Suez Canal, and then park them in Egypt, uh, a lot of them near to Cairo, in various camps around Cairo, while the Allies are, are, are working out what to do with these Empire troops. So as Ian has explained to us, uh, that nice Mr. Churchill and the Easterners. Just to explain that phrase, Easterners, in case you've not heard it before, um, the Westerners are those politicians and those military people who think we just need to fight in the West. The Western Front is the only place we need to worry about as far as Britain is concerned. The Easterners were the people who wanted to open up a second front, an additional front in the East. So that's where that, that phrase is. So these gentlemen are sitting around in the camps um in uh in egypt uh wondering what's going to happen and then word comes through we need you to go to uh to gallipoli because we, we're going to knock turkey out of the war um we foolishly think that the turks aren't good fighters uh, which they learn to their peril um so let's have a look at these various people and then i'll, I'll i've got a section on the medical provision in manchester so first of all, we have Private Michael Dowson. He's from Victoria. Uh, he's a miner. Uh, a few of the people that we come across have backgrounds in miners, and Ian has already mentioned that diggers, the Australians famous for digging into the rough terrain of Gallipoli, trying to get some level of shelter. Uh, so he enlists in September 1914. Um, he comes across in the, the troop ship ceramic hmat ceramic his majesty's australian transport um and um, so their group go in on the 25th of april the, the the famous day of the the big attacks as is a public holiday in australia for anzac day uh, he gets wounded on the 2nd of may uh, he gets a gunshot wound to the right knee and the very the very next day he's transferred to England on the hospital ship Gurkha. Uh, he comes to what's called the Second Western General Hospital. Now I assumed when I started all this that we were just talking about Withington Hospital, off oh, me to the northeast of Southern Cemetery, but no, Second Western General Hospital is various properties around Manchester. Uh, I've got a slide showing you. Uh, 25 locations so more on that um so our man dowson 
has got a shrapnel knee, shrapnel wound to his knee and secondary hemorrhage. Um, and he, he dies aged 22 uh, in the Chalton area. So if you know your way around Manchester, Chalton's to the west of Southern Cemetery. So our next man is Mr. Hahn, Ernest Frederick Hahn. Uh, and he is with the machine gun section of the 15th Battalion, comes from Victoria. He was a butcher by trade. He, he enlists at Toowoomba, and he comes across on that same troop ship, the, the HMAT Ceramic. Um, so 15th Battalion, um, and so they land on the 25th of April. Uh, he gets wounded on the 12th of May, severe wounds to his chest. Um, so that's the 12th of May. Uh, we, we estimate that it's maybe about two weeks or maybe even less for a troop ship, for a hospital ship to get you back to, to England. Um, and he's, he's at the Second Western General Hospital by the 29th of May. Now, those wounds uh, were part, part of the cause of his death, but he, he gets enteric fever. A number of our people get enteric fever. Um, and so he, he dies aged 51. Um, he was actually in Prestwich, which is North Manchester. Our next gentleman didn't start off as an Australian, as you could you might guess from his name, John Connor MacLeod. Uh, originally from Glenboy in Lanarkshire in Scotland. Um, he His family had moved to Australia when he was 16 and a half years old. Um, he's uh, a baker from Toowoomba in Queensland, is his profession. And uh, he's joined up with, uh, with the 15th Battalion. So, of course, it goes into action early on. He also is on the the transport ship the ceramic um so he is wounded in action with a gunshot wound to the forehead so it must have been a relatively minor wound because wound to your forehead you might likely to kill you um he's brought back second western general hospital uh and admitted on the 20th of may he only lasts for not not even four weeks and he dies on the 16th of june from enteric fever so he's, he's wounded but it's the enteric fever that, that takes him away and he also uh, dies in prestwich in north manchester uh, our next man is merwin who isn't um a, a soldier armed with a rifle he's australian army medical corps He's actually a New Zealander. He's a Kiwi, but he's gone over to Australia, possibly rather keen to get in the fight. Um, he he was born in Wanganui in New Zealand, 1886. Um, he's 29 years old, uh, and he's a miner from Queenstown in Tasmania. He comes over on the transport ship, the Katuna, uh, and he's a driver with the Australian Army Medical Corps. But clearly he's going forward. He's trying to recover uh, casualties. Now, he'd had trouble with, with bad health already. Uh, in March, he'd had bronchopneumonia uh, when he was in Egypt, but he got well enough to be sent to Gallipoli. Um, and he, uh, just trying to find his, his wound here, um, he was uh, he's on the the hospital ship the Navassa on the fifteenth of May. He'd had a gunshot wound to his hip, um, and uh, his his record showed died from wounds received in action. Uh, the cause of death listed as empyema and pneumonia, uh, having previously been reported wounded. So, move on to. Gentlemen, oh dear, my, uh, what a pity. My my image isn't working there. This is annoying. I uh, don't know quite why that's happened. Um, so there's a, you should be seeing a, a picture of a gravestone. Um, no, don't worry. Uh, this is a gentleman 
uh, with the rejoicing the extraordinary name of Speedwell Tregertha. I thought, what a, what an exotic name. Um, it's from Geelong in Victoria. Um, and the Tregertha name actually comes from Cornwall. So he's a mi uh, he's been a miner. The family are involved in mining. His first name is uh, from a mine in Australia, a gold mine, where uh, possibly his grandfather had been the manager in the 1880s. I wonder whether that mine had been named for the Speedwell Cavern in the late in Derbyshire. Um, so, 25 years old, he's a miner. He joins from Black Boy Camp in Western Australia. Uh, he departs on her, her, His Majesty's Australian transport, the Etonus, um, and uh, he's wounded in action on the 14th of May. Gunshot wound to the right leg and compound fracture of the femur. Uh, goes to a reception hospital in Mustafa, uh, admitted to the general hospital in Alexander, and then invalided back to England on the hospital ship Navassa. Uh, he dies in August in East Manchester Royal Infirmary. So that's a different hospital site, which is somewhere in Chalton. This is still, you know, still early days in, the, in our research here. I think we've been in this for about three months now. Uh, there's still lots of questions that we're, we're trying to answer. Here we have Charles Walter Williams, uh, familiarly known as Wally. Um, he's born in Victoria, um, and he's a, a labourer. Uh, he's enlisted in September, and he comes over on the the transport ship, the Ulysses. Uh, so uh, he's with the Force Brigade, landing at Anzac Cove, of course, on the 25th of April. Wounded in action sometime between the 1st and the 3rd of May and then admitted to the hospital in Alexandra with a gunshot wound to the lumbar region, a severe wound, um, gets put onto the, the hospital ship, the Delta, in June, 2nd of June, and then uh, he's in Manchester Hospital um, and dies on the 28th of June. Um, that was in Prestwich, which is North Manchester. So now we get on to... Two New Zealand gentlemen. Uh, so we have Andrew Gordon Herbert of the Otago Mounted Rifles. Now um, he was he joined the war hoping to 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 fight as a cavalryman, as a as a mounted man on a horse. Um, but of course, Gallipoli is no place for horses. There just isn't the room for cavalry to be used in Gallipoli, so the horses are left behind in Egypt, and a number of men from the Otago Mounted Rifles are left behind looking after the horses, so they're safe. Um, so Gallipoli, not a good place for horses. I would say not a good place for human beings either, but that's where the fighting was. So he comes over. Uh, he's enlisted in December 1915. He had been a butcher, um, and uh, He's hospitalized with gunshot wound in his left thigh stroke buttock. Um, received in action on the 21st of September. Um, but then he also picks up enteric fever dysentery, uh, which is what kills him in October, 19th of October. Uh, he's aged 29 years. Uh, again, Second Western General Hospital, which could have been in any one of 25 odd places around Manchester. Our next New Zealander is a uh, gentleman, Ibbotson, Richard Ibbotson. He's with the medical corps, but again, he's, he's exposed to enemy fire, which is how he gets wounded. Um, so he's been evacuated to Malta aboard the ship, the, the H hospital ship Somali. Uh, in a moment, when Ian takes over, he'll tell us about a, a medical fellow called Pritchard, who was also on the... the um, uh, the, the hospital ship, the Somali. It was thought that he was out of danger. Um, he's got shrapnel wounds in his back and thigh. Uh, and then he dies of wounds um, 
in uh, in Second Western General Hospital. Now, uh, this is the uh, uh, another slide. So we we've seen individual graves which are cared for by the um, Commonwealth War Graves uh, people who do a wonderful job. Um, now we're on to a, a family memorial. So this is the Weber family of New Zealand. And what we have here is, is a grave to the elder brother. So it's a memorial to the elder, elder brother, Alain. Uh, but the, the grave is actually to Gerard K. Weber of the 10th Royal Fusiliers. He's been wounded in France in Beaucourt sur Ancre. And then he's been brought back to Man Manchester where he's died so it's his grave but when they when they set up the gravestone they remembered his elder brother and there's there's the detail here uh elaine weber of the new zealand mounted rifles so as we've said uh they left their horses behind they're not very useful in gallipoli uh killed in action at bow shops hill on gallipoli now, it says uh, August the 6th, 1916. That, that's an error. It was August the 6th, 1915. Age 27, buried where he fell. So there's there's the family remembering this gentleman. The commander at, Beauch at Beauchops Hill was called Beauchops, so, uh, and he was killed there as well. So it was named for him. So now I get to explain a bit about the hospital system over here. Um, so the second Western General Hospital, the first Western General Hospital was actually in Fasakali in Liverpool. So there's 25 locations that, well, it says 24 there, but uh, I'm sure I found another one around Greater Manchester. Um, that's the total of beds that they had. Overall, there's anywhere between 30 to 40 military hospitals in Manchester. Very often they were taking over schools, particularly schools that have been recently finished, they they told the school children you're going to have to go for your education elsewhere. They ran a, a stiff system, so morning school and afternoon school, and then they they used the buildings as a hospital. This is Juicy Avenue. This is a big family house in the um, Victoria Park area, Daisy Bank Road. Um, it was actually owned by a, it had been owned by a German family, Neuberg. So in a sense, it's kind of quite appropriate that it had been owned by Germans. And now it's taken over as a military hospital. Um, there's Nell Lane Military Hospital, which was what um, the, uh, the Withington Hospital had been called. And my final slide here uh, is just a rather nice picture of Southern Cemetery in the snow. Um, so there we go. No copyright infringement intended. I will stop sharing and over to you, Ian. Yeah, if if I could just make a couple of points. Weber is um, died on the 6th of August. And I think he's the only one with a connection to the Suvla landings. And I'll explain what I mean by that later on. Most of the uh, casualties were either uh, suffered in, in the Anzac um, in the Anzac uh, front, on the Anzac front rather, or on the Hellas front, particularly in uh, around Krithia, which I'll talk about. Um, Tim has highlighted the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and um, uh, all of the Australians um, and New Zealanders, apart from Weber, are actually buried there. And why are they buried there? Because they came to Manchester to die, really. Um, because they were se very seriously wounded and they were brought to hospitals in Manchester because they were so seriously wounded they couldn't be dealt with in Gallipoli, in Malta or Lemnos or Alexandria and they came to Manchester very seriously ill and as Tim has quite rightly said quite a few of them um, were suffering from illness as well as the wounds as well as the wounds and it's a combination of that illness and wounds um, that polish them off um, we're fortunate in that we've got a lot more information on the australians um, because uh, their records are much better their central records government owned records are much better uh, than the british ones in britain we have to rely on organizations such as uh, ancestry and so on so 
Um, as I go through the Brits now, um, for the next 10 minutes or so, um, we have less information on them. Okay, so I'll just share the screen. And... There we go. So um, I'll just test I can. Oh, no, I'll do it in a moment. So uh, Greater Manchester and Gallipoli. Uh, obviously, many Manchester men fought at Gallipoli. And many Mancunians in um, many of the regiments present, even the Irish ones. I'm sure you can find a Mancunian in the Dublin Fusiliers, the Munster Fusiliers, etc. And a number of Mancunians, uh, of course, uh, served with the Anzacs, having been born in Manchester and um, emigrated to uh, Australia. Um, Wilcock um, for, served in the Fourth Royal Scots, for example, um, and they're a regiment that doesn't have much connection with Manchester, um, and he survived the Gallipoli campaign, killed in Palestine on the 12th of November 1917, but aged only 19. And um, uh, we'll distinguish between those who uh, served in Gallipoli, survived, fought in Gallipoli and survived, and died in later campaigns, in Wilcox's case in Palestine, um, but others in uh, France, and we'll mention those as we're going along. But he's commemorated on the Jerusalem Memorial, uh, and we don't know, we don't have enough information on him to know where his body finally rested. I doubt uh, he could have been missing altogether. Uh, Goodall uh, served with the Lancashire Fusiliers um, and probably a regular. We don't know for certain, um, but the first Lancashire Fusiliers, as I mentioned before, part of the 29th Division, um, served uh, uh, famously awarded six VCs before breakfast, but not taking anything away from the great bravery, only one of these men was from the Northwest. And he was killed in action on the 4th of June, age 32, taking part in the Third Battle of Krithia. So there were some regulars in the 29th Division involved in that battle. His body was not found, and he's commemorated on the Hellas Memorial. There's only one of the British Gallipolians, we think, buried in uh, the cemetery. All the others are uh, either a few buried in France, um, buried one or two, I think only one, in Gallipoli, uh, the, and the rest are commemorated on the monument to the missing, the Hellas Memorial, 21,000 names on there, um, and um, they're commemorated there. But they, they, we found them in the cemetery because they're commemorated on family memorials, on family memorials rather than uh, graveyards. Um, so, next one. Um, so, there's Goodall. Um, I've got not found on there, but I think we might have found him. I'm not quite sure. Um, but some of these graves are very difficult to uh, track down. Uh, there's Goodall, um, the Lancashire Fusilier probably involved in that landing on the 25th of all, uh, April, but survived. And there's Wilcock, uh, the Scotsman, fourth Royal Scots, killed in action. Whoops, I'm jumping forward here. There we go. Uh, uh, killed in action in Palestine. And there's his memorial in the cemetery. See, it's a family memorial, but his body is not there. It's We're not quite sure what it is. It's commemorated in the... Uh, Jerusalem, the Com Commonwealth War Graves, Jerusalem Memorial, which you see a picture there. So the 4th Battalion Royal Scots, just to tell you a little bit about it, um, you can see a superb um, uh, talk um, on our YouTube channel given by a brilliant historian, i.e. myself, about the Scottish in, um, the Scottish in, um, the Scots rather, in um, Gallipoli and the uh, Lowland Division. Um, the Lowland Division uh, was a very uh, important division. 52nd Lowland Division, uh, composed of territorials. We'll come back to that. And uh, uh, he, Wilcock, uh, served in that battalion, fought in um, the Battle of Gully Ravine, the 14th of June, and suffered very severe casualties, went on 
um, to be based in Egypt and then moved to uh, moved to uh, France and saw the west the rest of the war out in France. Uh, and there's a memorial to uh, uh, the officers of the 52nd Lowland Division uh, in Edinburgh. I think that's uh, very close to Edinburgh Station. So uh, the Scots, unlike the French, really remember Gallipoli. There's very big events, um, commemorative events on the 25th of April up in Scotland and particularly in the Lowlands where many of these Scottish territorials came from. Um, say Wilcott was a Mancunian, uh, but he was obviously recruited um, by uh, the, the Scots and ended up in that battalion. There were Mancunian units um, and they were much more likely to be grouped together. Um, um, they weren't grouped together, of course, in regular battalions like the Lancashire Fusiliers. I said that of the six VCs, only one was from Lancashire. Um, they often uh, recruited from very large areas, a regular regiment. Uh, but the Manchester men more likely to be grouped together when they answered Kitchener's call and volunteered. For example, uh, the 34th Brigade, 11th North Division, Northern Division, made up of battalions from the Northwest. 38th Brigade of the 13th Western Division, uh, made up of men from the Northwest. The uh, 11th Northern Division suffered very heavily on the Suba front in this terrible offensive on August the 21st. Um, nobody, no, um, uh, no men from that division were found buried in or commemorated rather in the cemetery and um, the 13th western division fought on the anzac front suffered very heavy casualties <clears throat> um, in a diversionary attack because of the suva landings but again we haven't found any um, any men from that division commemorated in the cemetery the key division that we're really interested in 42nd east lancashire division and they were territorials now uh, the territory is incredibly complex, volunteers, militia, etc., all brought together in 1980, 1908 in the Haldane reforms. Um, so there were territorial infantry, uh, cavalry were yeomanry and uh, medical units and so on. They were part time soldiers. They were part time soldiers and um, they did full time jobs and then they um, they did uh, training at the weekend um, and camps at um, uh, camps during the summer holidays. Very popular, very big culture in Manchester and Birmingham, where I'm coming from at the moment. Very big culture of volunteering, of being part of uh, uh, the territorial forces. Uh, there were no shortage of recruits. Uh, they were meant uh, to be for home defence. For home defence only, um, but be, they were given the opportunity to volunteer uh, to go abroad, and the majority of them did. And um, the, for example, the 125th Brigade, which was composed of um, territorial battalions, um, land, went to Egypt. They stayed in Egypt for about five months, and uh, then involved in the Second Battle of Krithia. The entire division were really interested in this battle, the Third Battle of Krithia in June, and then the Battle of Krithia Vineyard in August. Evacuated January 1916, severely depleted, 395 officers and 8,152 8, other ranks were killed, wounded and missing. Do you have 395 officers in a division? Sounds an awful lot to me, uh, but it was because of replacements. Replacements, officers were killed and others replaced. You know, this, this thing about officers only lasting six weeks on the Western Front, I think it was uh, a lot less in Gallipoli. So there's this, the large Northern contingent, um, the 125th Brigade, 126th Brigade, and what we're particularly interested in, in terms of the cemetery, the 127th Brigade, um, those 1st, 5th, 1st, 6th, 1st, 7th, 1st, 8th, they were all territorial battalions. Were they untrained? No. They'd had a lot of training. Were they experienced? No. Um, going into Gallipoli was their first taste of action. Very enthusiastic knew each other, the, the um, uh, NCOs and officers 
were often part of the community. The officer might have been uh, the manager at the, uh, the factory or the owner of the factory or whatever. And the, they were recruited from the South Manchester area. And so were very, very close to the cemetery. So unlike the Australians who had no connection really with Manchester, but sadly came to die, uh, these young men had a very close affinity with southern Manchester. And when they died, very sadly we talk about those that died, uh, their parents asked them to be commemorated on their family memorials. Only one, we think, is buried of these Brits, is buried in the cemetery. Uh, so the survivors, there's some that served and survived. Private Wilfred Bailey died of wounds 30th of August, age 24. Um, but according to the inscription on, his, on the family grave, service in Sudan, Egypt, Gallipoli and France. So he's probably 20 when he signed up. Uh, it doesn't seem to have any recognition by the Commonwealth War Graves or any on and any Commonwealth War Graves Memorial, served with the second ninth Manchester. And we're fortunate to have Mike Crane, who's um, a, a member of them, um, the um, Philippi Association on the tour this afternoon, is expert on uh, the Manchester territorials. And the second Manchesters fed into the first Manchesters. So Wilfred Bailey, um, I said he, uh, that unit didn't serve in Gallipoli, but they fed into the first uh, uh, into the other Manchester, uh, the other local territorial battalions. Uh, Private Charles Taylor Bryan killed in action in France on the 2nd of September, aged 26. Very young men, very young men when they, they volunteered. Buried in Barncourt Military Cemetery. And he served with the first six Manchester. So this, this research project, brilliant project, really enjoyed it great community that I've been working with. Um, at first, it was all random. Then this, this, this pattern began appearing of Manchester territorials, the first six, uh, the seventh, ninth, etc. So, and something else really emerged, but there's Barncourt uh, Military Cemetery in France, beautifully kept, but of course, um, the cemeteries in Turkey are also beautifully kept as well. And there's Bailey's uh, cemetery. No, um, um, family grave. Family grave. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Been a long day. A long day. Um, and um, notice they are family graves. So the details, the details uh, differ. There was no rules to what details you put on. So sometimes they contain the date of death. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes the regimental number, sometimes the rank, sometimes the unit. Um, so there's Charles Wilfred Bailey and uh, there's um, Charles Taylor Bryan uh, there. OK. Um, Private John Jackson. Now, we know quite a lot about him because of research done and ending up on a website or a Facebook page to do um, connected with Manchester City Football Club. Um, so we know quite a lot about John Jackson. Unfortunately, we only have a picture, one picture, a uh, picture of one of the Brits. He enlisted in the 1st 7th, that was 120, uh, 127 Brigade, involved in the uh, uh, the Battle of Crithia, as we'll see. Born in Wales, though, but he lived on Moldoth Road, Willington, so very local to um, the cemetery. Cabinet maker, employed in his father's business. He ended up in the Gallipoli Theatre, on the 6th of May 1915, contracted a severe bout of dysentery there and was invalided back to the UK, admitted to Salisbury Infirmary. Father John Jackson, Mother Anna, he was married, married at uh, Chalton, discharged medically unfit for further service, 8th of March 1916, died of debility as a result of dysentery. Some people recovered from dysentery, famous recoverer, for want of a better word, was Clement Attlee, the Prime Minister, served in one of the East Lanks uh, regiments in the 42nd uh, Division. Uh, but sadly, Private John Jackson didn't, died in Colwyn Bay, and he has a, a Commonwealth War Grave headstone and is buried in the cemetery. I think he's the only Gallipolian to be buried in the cemetery. 
and there's his grave there. And the only his... British Gallipolian. Yes, sorry, the only British Gallipolian. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And officers, we often have a little bit more uh, detail about officers. Lieutenant Harold William Ingram, uh, he was born 1885. He served in A Company, the 1st 8th Manchesters. The majority of the Brits served with the 1st 6th Manchesters, killed in action at the Third Battle of Crithia, 4th of June 1915. So I talked about uh, thinking it was just going to be random, but there was the territorial pattern emerging and also the deaths on the 4th of June or the 5th of June 1915, the Third Battle of Crithia. And that for South Manchester Cemetery and South Manchester generally was an absolutely crucial date. But he's buried in Lancashire's Landing Cemetery at Etchabat. So he's one of the few that has an, a grave in Gallipoli because most of them, their uh, resting places were lost. They were temporarily buried, they were lost and then mentioned on the Hellas Memorial. And there's a death plaque on his grave. He's also mentioned on the Ardwick Memorial. Uh, officers uh, tend to be mentioned on lots of memorials and there's a very grainy picture of the Ardwick Memorial being unveiled and there in his Scottish regalia is Sir Ian Hamilton standing there in the middle of the picture there. And there's his grave, see Lieutenant William Harold Ingram and the death penalty, very rare to have a death penalty. Uh, death, death, uh, death penny? Death penny, <laughs> yes, there certainly was a penalty uh, of death penny um, to um, to um, Lieutenant William Howard Ingram in the cemetery, which we saw today. So quite a few of them, quite a few of those commemorated were with the 127th Brigade. Private Arthur Bell served with the 1st 7th Manchester, killed action 4th of June 1915, aged 20. Private Arthur Herbert Howell served in the 1st 6th Manchester, declared missing on the 5th of June 1915, aged 21. Bell aged only 20, very young men, of course. And Mike Crane today said that he's an expert on the battle of Third Battle of Crithia. Um, the casualties were just as heavy on the 5th of June 1915. Private Sidney Macmillan, also with the first six Manchesters, killed in action 4th of June. There's that date again, 4th of June 1914. Two of his brothers were also killed in the First World War, mentioned and are mentioned on the headstone. They commemorated on the Hellas Memorial. These three have no known graves in Gallipoli. They're comm commemorated on the Hellas Memorial. Remember, the two of the survivors I talked about earlier were also involved in the Third Battle of Crithia. And uh, there's bells, and notice the um, it's gone gone but not forgotten, um, commemorated on a family memorial. And there's howl, but notice the very small amount of information, very small amount of information on howl. There was no rules about how they were commemorated on uh, what information you had to put. And um, there's uh, the third one there and his brother was killed in action on whoops was killed in action in France for the 20th battalion at Royal Fusiliers So what happened on the 4th of June, the Third Battle of Crithia in Hellas? Number of attempt to capture the village. Uh, both the 29th, we saw one of the Fusiliers uh, was um, involved in that battle, and the 42nd Division were involved. At least 244 soldiers uh, from Greater Manchester died that day, one of the worst losses for this region on the 4th of June. Private Goodall... Um, served in the Lancashire Fusiliers, as a, we talked about him earlier. He was um, almost certainly in the, he was a regular, and he served in, uh, he um, took part in the landings on the 25th of April, killed on that first day. 
127 brigade, very heavily involved. Uh, one report states 770 men of the six Manchester went into action by nightfall when the roll was called, only 160 were fit. 48 had been killed. Mid-morning attack preceded by a two-phase bombardment of the Turkish positions. Most of the guns uh, on the 20th sector that were attacked by the 29th Division, uh, did they deliberately neglect the territorials because they thought they wouldn't do as well? Um, that's a debating point. And, uh, but uh, the first six managed to break through the Turkish lines and actually capture more than 200 prisoners of war. Um, but with the, uh, the failure of attack on the flanks, uh, the British were able to continue their advance. Uh, the Turks launched a fierce counterattack to regain their trenches, apart from a small section jutting into the vineyard. And the third battle was followed by the Battle of uh, uh, Krithia Vineyard. And there it is. That's the Krithia. Um, some... British troops had made it there on the first day, way back on the 25th of April, but recalled. It was an objective on the first day. That was the furthest the line ever got. It's almost like the Stalingrad of Hellas. Uh, they never, British never able to capture it. Uh, there was where the 127th uh, Brigade were. And that, I think, is the bulge in the trenches, uh, the line that they uh, achieved. Um, on the end of Hellas through great bravery, great bravery there. Um, so there's a long account, and I won't read it through, read it through Private Ridley Sheldon, who wrote a diary there. Um, but he talks about, I'll never forget the moment when we had to leave the shelter of the trenches. It was terrible, the first step that, to take. And he was wounded there. Um, I walked, I crawled, I dragged myself along as best I could. Um, and uh, he was continually stumbling over them. And he got back to eventually um, to his own lines. Um, but a very dramatic account written in the diary of one of the privates. No connection with Southern Manchester Cemetery, Ridley Sheldon of the first six. Um, so the specialists, there were some specialists amongst them. Uh, William Bridget, an in, interesting middle name for a young man. Uh, William Bridget Pritchard, born in 1868, son of Alderman, Alderman Pritchard, so a counsellor, educated at Manchester Grammar School, studied medicine at Manchester University, surgeon and anaesthetist for the Ocean Steamship Company and the China Steamship. Uh, China Station, and then the surgeon at Victoria Dental Hospital. Joined the Territorials in 1900, rising to command the 1st, 2nd East Lancashire Field Ambulance. Now, I didn't realise until I did this research that uh, Territorials, uh, there were Territorial units, ambulance units, but it's quite logical that they were, were. He was working at Manchester Cancer Pavilion when the war broke out, commissioned as Lieutenant Colonel, in the Royal Army Medical Corps and placed in command of the 1st, 2nd uh, Field Ambulance, which was the unit, the Field Ambulance for 42nd Division. His two brothers also served under him, a very auspicious family. 24th of June, that's after 3rd Krithia, um, probably in this period of wastage, around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, inspecting a forward dressing station. He was hit by shell fire and seriously wounded. Died of his wounds, buried at sea aboard hospital ship Somali. Tim has already mentioned that en route to Malta. And he was buried at sea and he was commemorated on the Hellas Memorial. 47, 47. And there's a picture of him. That's the picture, the only picture we have of the Brits. Um, but if anybody else wants to research these and be involved in the research project to find out more about them, uh, they're most welcome. And uh, there's his. It's his father's grave, uh, but it's put on the side there, uh, Pritchard, his, um, his memorial there. And that is it. OK, so. Very good. Um, Ian, yeah. I've, if, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen. Yeah. I've, I've just got two, two more pictures. Yes. Uh, so uh, thank you to the, to the gentleman who found the website with Tregertha on it. 
Um, so I'll just share my screen now, and hopefully this works. There we go. Uh, oh, hang on. Uh, is that showing a... Yes. yes. Yep, right, so, so there's Speedwell Tregertha's, um grave that uh, mysteriously disappeared before. And then here we have the the newly found grave so this we only saw this for the first time today the um senior guy at uh the cemetery peter had found this one for us this is the family grave of the dearden family and we have uh private dearden of the lancashire fusiliers he survived gallipoli so he did very well with that um but he, he ended up being killed in in france in 1918 